sake and the sake of the brethren there. Went down to Berea, began to preach there in Berea. And uh, the Jews came and stirred up against him. Uh, then he went down to Athens and met with the Greek philosophers there and was pretty well mocked and very few accepted the message. So I think by the time he got to Corinth, humanly speaking, he was pretty shell-shocked. He was pretty uh, physically run down and mentally and, and so forth. And it was a blessing to find that wonderful Christian couple, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, who took him in and gave him a place to stay and gave him some work to do and just uh, really uh, helped Paul when he came to Corinth. But he said, that's how I felt, humanly speaking, but then homiletically, in other words, through his preaching, he preached a pretty clear message. Verse number, uh, verse number two, he said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we saw this in chapter number one, that his message was uh, the preaching of the gospel. Uh, even though it was a dividing message, it, it confounded the wise, even though it was very profound that God would use the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe, uh, he said, that's what I preached. Uh, he didn't have some flowery message of religion, but he preached Christ and uh, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse number five, he said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. So his message was very, very clear. And yet oratorically, he said his manner of delivering that message was very plain and basic. In verse 1 he said, I came not with excellency of speech and of wisdom. Uh, and then in verse number uh, 4 he says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. Uh, Paul didn't have uh, necessarily the, the gift of being able to sway great throngs of people with his uh, way of speaking. He was pretty blunt, pretty straightforward, and uh, as the Corinthians who didn't like him would say, his speech is contemptible. I don't know what that all means, but I know that, uh, you know, God uses the message, not the messenger, although the messenger delivers it, but it was the power of God, the preaching of the gospel, that changed lives because people were saved, they were converted, and uh, a church was established there. And spiritually, his ministry was spirit-filled and powerful. Again, in verse number four, he says his preaching was in demonstration of the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, and of power. And that's what we need today, brethren. That's what we need in the preaching of the gospel. Uh, a simple, plain, straightforward message, but we need desperately for God, the Spirit of God, to own that message and to drive it into the hearts of, of sinners because it's the Spirit of God who convicts men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And when the Spirit of God uses the Word of God, it produces the wonderful result of uh, giving the gift of eternal life. So Paul uh, is talking about his preaching and, of course, when he went to Corinth, if you read the account in Acts chapter 18, his preaching met with resistance from the Jews. He went to the Jews first, as his practice was, and they didn't really like the message that he preached until Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, was saved, and others, his family. And so Paul turned his preaching toward the Gentiles, to the Greeks. And there were many Greeks in this city. Now, the Greeks are different. Uh, you'll notice if you look back across the page to chapter 1, the difference in the way that uh, uh, the Jews and the Greeks would, uh, would uh, listen to the uh, word of God. The Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now both of those are wrong because uh, the Jews wouldn't believe the word of God at its face value. They wanted to see some miraculous sign. Jesus said an evil and, and an adulterous generation always seeketh after a sign. So they wouldn't believe what God's word said because they needed a sign. Uh, the, the, the Greeks, on the other hand, they, they were looking after, uh, for wisdom. They were looking for a philosophical approach. And uh, that was a hallmark of the Greek-speaking world, known for its philosophy. And the word philosophy simply means a love of wisdom. But Greek, Greek philosophy, which permeated the ancient world 
as it does today, uh, had a problem in that it was human wisdom, and human wisdom doesn't equate to divine wisdom. There's a lot of smart people in the world today, but their wisdom, their philosophy is not biblical. It's not, it's not the, the sound philosophy. Chapter 1, verse 25 we read, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I mean, we have a lot of people today who would claim to be educated, claim to have their philosophy of life, and yet it is totally opposed to what God's word has to say. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the Bible just makes it clear there that uh, God, the foolishness of God, if there was such a thing, it's not an attribute of God, I'll tell you that. He's not foolish. But if he was foolish, even his foolishness would be way above the highest wisdom of human intellect there possibly could be. And here's the fact. Any wisdom that is not founded on and grounded upon an all-wise God is going to be faulty. And uh, the book of Romans actually makes a comment about this in God's commentary on the decline of humanity. You see, we're told by these philosophers that we are evolving and life is getting better. Uh, you're supposed to believe that, right? Well, actually, the Bible says that man was created perfect and he's getting worse. And Romans chapter 1 gives us a commentary of that. And I want to read just a couple of verses here. Romans 1 verse 21 through 23. The Bible says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, professing themselves to become wise, that's why a lot of the instructors at the colleges call themselves professors because they want you to think that they're wise. But if their wisdom is not based on what God is and who God is, uh, then it's a faulty wisdom. And we need to understand that. What has human wisdom produced? What has human wisdom produced? Well, if human wisdom, human intelligence, is used to understand the natural laws of God's creation, then it produces much. And we in the modern world are recipients of uh, science, proper science and proper use of the intellect and the intelligence that God has put into man. And uh, whenever that is used properly, we are the benefits of many discoveries and in uh, matters of health and exploration. I mean, this is a marvelous world in which we live. So when human wisdom is used aright, uh, it is a powerful tool. But if it's used to eliminate God from any consideration, all it does is produce disaster. I was thinking about this the other day, the contrast. According to the Bible, Adam named all the animals. That was quite an assignment, don't you think? I looked it up. I don't know how this, they come about this. But uh, someone has estimated that there are 8.7 million uh, animal uh, species in the world, uh, of which only 1.2 million are actually known. So don't ask me how that figured out, but that's a lot either way you cut it. 5.62 million of these animals uh, in this estimation are terrestrial animals. That means they're earth-dwelling animals. 5.62. Now, I don't think Adam named all of those. If he might have. He had super intelligence. There's no doubt about it. Some people think that on Noah's Ark, there were 7,876 pairs of land vertebrae animals that went on the Ark. Now, if you go to the, uh, the Ark in uh, Kentucky, it's very, very interesting, and uh, they point out that it wasn't necessarily one of every kind of animal, but they, they were one of every species, but one of every kind. So there weren't uh, a million dogs on the ark, you know, the little dogs, the big dogs, and the in-between dogs, and the ones that are nasty, and the ones that are cute. There was just a pair of dogs. They all belonged to the same whatever. But, you know, 
whatever it turns out. Adam named the animals. But what has modern philosophical science done? It's turned man into an animal. Uh, These two things are poles apart. And when we place our faith in the wisdom of man, then that wisdom is going to be ever-changing. All you've got to do is think of the so-called scientific pronouncements that are made today, that we're told this and then it changes to this, whether it's evolution, now that's changed a little bit because, uh, well, they have no answer. Uh, Talk about the... uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the COVID situation, we're told this, now we're told that. Uh, global warming, it used to be climate change, now it's, or it used to be global warming, now it's climate change. Because they have no basis. It's just a foolish imagination in their minds, not based on science in all, at all, but uh, on the wisdom of man. And the reason that it's going to be ever-changing it's, it's kind of the commentary we read in Acts 17 of the Greek philosophers in Athens that Paul dealt with. The Bible says they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And that's how it is. Just spins around, spins around. The wisdom of man that is devoid of, of God, when God is put out of, of the equation, is just going to spin around and be ever-changing and make no sense. But this morning I want to speak to you about the wisdom of God because the wisdom of God is eternal, it is infinite, it is transcendent, it is unchanging and it is truth. The wisdom of man, you go by that in your life, it's like building your house on on the sand. Jesus spoke about that. It may look good but when the storms of life come, the house will fall flat. You'll have nothing left. When we build our life on the wisdom of God, it's like building our house on the rock. In fact, it is the rock, Jesus Christ. And it is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. You know, perhaps the greatest anthem that explains and extols the wisdom of God is Proverbs chapter 8. You ought to read that sometime. Proverbs chapter 8 is the personification of wisdom. Wisdom is presented as a person. It's uh, speaking as I, and it tells you a lot about wisdom. In fact, the book of Proverbs is all about wisdom, the wisdom of God, but that chapter is, uh, is worth reading. But I want to speak about the wisdom of God because that's what Paul says here in chapter 2. He said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And this is something that's so important for you and I. And so I want to ask three questions. I want to answer three questions this morning as we look at this. Number one, where can we find God's wisdom? Number two, why can we trust God's wisdom? And then number three, how can we know God's wisdom? So let's look at these very quickly this morning. The first question is, where can we find God's wisdom? Well, let me tell you this, that it is not hidden. Uh, In verse number 7, Paul says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, where the Bible says that it is a hidden wisdom, it does not mean that there is a cache of wisdom out there somewhere that only the initiated can Uh, can access and can understand. Now, there are some religions that teach that, you know, that uh, there is a hidden wisdom, and for you uh, who sit in the pew, you'll never know, but we're the ones who will tell you what this wisdom is. That's not what this verse is teaching us. Uh, It's not saying that, and I'll tell you why, because in verse number 7, it says that God ordained it before the world unto our glory. (laughs) So he's not going to hide this from us, But it is hidden in the sense that uh, uh, we cannot comprehend God's wisdom with the natural mind or through the senses. Look at verse number 9. As it is written, I have not seen. So we cannot physically see God's wisdom in that sense. Neither ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. By the way... 
Heaven is a wonderful place. Uh, it really is. It is uh, this, this verse tells us that it, has, it cannot even be conceived with the human mind, this wonderful place that is being prepared. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. In my Father's house are many mansions. And the Bible says that we cannot see this with the human eye. We cannot hear it with the human ear. It really can't even be comprehended in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So that means heaven is more glorious than even the last two chapters of the Bible can put in our language. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we find that uh, there is this vision of heaven, and I personally feel like it was Paul who uh, actually died and went to heaven when he was stoned at Lystra. He was uh, dragged out of the city. They thought he was dead. I think that probably he did die. And uh, he went and he saw something. And this is, he's not telling us it's him, but he says, I know someone, you know how that is. He said in verse 1, it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. He didn't know if he really died or not, but this is what happened. He said, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Whoever this man was, he had a, 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 a vision or he was literally taken to the third heaven, which is where God is, the throne of God. And what he saw and what he heard, he said, it's not lawful. I cannot, I cannot write this. And I think it's because there are no words in the human vocabulary to fully describe this place called heaven. And if you're saved, one day you'll know, you'll see, you'll be there. But these future glories are hidden from the human eye. And so that's what Paul means here in verse number 7 when he talks about the mystery and the hidden wisdom. That There are some things that we cannot comprehend with the human senses that we have. But I want you to notice also verse 10, it goes on to say, but God hath revealed them unto us. And so we do have a revelation from God of these things. He has re revealed them uh, unto us. The wisdom of God has been revealed to man. Not everything there is to know, but everything we need to know. God has given us the revelation of his wisdom. I like the scripture in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. It kind of explains it this way. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So the wisdom of God that has been revealed belongs to us, all right? That's where it is. According to Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And, uh, of course, this is referring to the written word of God, to the Bible. The wisdom of God is supernatural. Super means above. It's above the natural. That's why he talks about things that are hidden and certainly hidden from those who are without Christ, the natural man, hidden from human philosophy. They cannot understand who God is. You cannot bring God down into a single thought. You cannot put God into a test tube and, and analyze him. He's the creator. He is the almighty God. And so there are things that are hidden from man, but God has revealed them to us. Wonderful truth. The wisdom of God is supernatural and the word of God is supernatural wisdom. It's the word of truth. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse number 5, every word of God is pure. Every word. 
This is the revelation that God has given to us. So where can we find God's wisdom? Well, hopefully you have a copy of it sitting on your lap and you're reading it today. It's the Word of God. It's the Bible. Well, the next question is, can we trust or why can we trust God's wisdom? Why can we trust God's word? And it's important that we do trust God's word because let's put it this way, all of our hopes for eternity depend on this book. Your hope for heaven needs to depend on the power of God, the wisdom and power of God. If your hope for heaven is dependent on Mary, she's not going to get you there. If your hope for heaven is dependent on your baptism, it's not going to get you there. If it's dependent on being a member of this church or any other religious organization, that's not going to cut it. Our faith depends on the word of God. So we better trust the word of God because we are, when we get saved, we are saying, I I accept what God says about me, about Christ, about salvation, and that's what we're looking for. And the good thing is we can trust the Bible because of the way that it came to us. In fact, that's explained here in this chapter, and I want to go through that. The Bible was not uh, the sayings of self-proclaimed prophets or some man. Uh, It's not the words of a guru. It's not written by men who colluded, got together and said, let's invent a religion. Uh, It wasn't dictated from behind a curtain by someone who was wearing special prism glasses. The Bible tells us how we received this wonderful book. And there were three steps that I want to bring out very briefly. I think most of you would know these, but I want to remind us, first of all, God's word was revealed. There has to be revelation of truth. And we see that word even mentioned there in verse number 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. If God didn't reveal truth, we wouldn't have truth. Because truth doesn't come from man, it comes from God. He is truth. And so God revealed truth to us. That is the beginning of how we got our Bible, that God revealed truth. He was the mover. He was the giver of truth. If you go back to the the very creation of man, when God created man and put him in the garden, it was God who spoke first. God communicates God desires to communicate with each of us, have a relationship with each of us. It wasn't Adam who found himself in the garden and said, I wonder where God is. It was God who came to Adam and began to give him the commandments of what he was to do in the garden. God reveals, and as we see there in verse number 11, if God didn't speak, we wouldn't know. For what man knoweth knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? So we we can understand ourselves, but even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. And it is the Spirit of God who has revealed truth to us. Well, God revealed truth down through the ages to various men, but the next step is that it was recorded. God's truth was recorded so that all generations would have it. We call this step inspiration. Inspiration is a Bible word. It it refers to the supernatural recording of God's truth. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21 tells us what that meant. It said, for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God used men to write the Bible, but they wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. That's a supernatural thing. God used human instruments to pen his words But these are not the words of man's wisdom. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. So the Bible, though it was written by man, does not convey or contain the wisdom of man. And the reason was because the Bible was supernaturally given. God reveals truth, then God has that truth recorded. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. Not just a part of the Bible, the bits and pieces you like. It's all, by, all the Bible is given by inspiration of God. And that word 
or that expression, inspiration of God, literally means God breathed. Inspire, inspiration means he breathed in. He didn't breathe out. I think of that shapeless or shaped lump of clay lying there in the Garden of Eden until the Spirit of God breathed in life and he became a living soul. And these words that were written down, the Spirit of God breathed life and this book is a living book. The Bible says that it's quick, alive and powerful. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life, Jesus said. This is a living book because it's a supernatural book. And truth was revealed and truth was recorded. And then lastly, the third thing is that um, it was retained. Because in verse number 16, the Bible says right at the end there, we have the mind of Christ. We have it. The Bible is not some lost book that we have to uh, imagine once existed. We have a copy of it. You have a copy of God's word today. And with that in, sitting in your lap or in your hands today, you have the mind of Christ. You want to know how God thinks about anything, just read it. He'll have something to say about it in his word. If he doesn't say anything about it, we don't need to know it. Because he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. By the way, if you look at verse 13, uh, there's a word there that you need to circle. Verse 13 says, which things also we speak, not in the words plural, not in the words which men's wisdom teacheth, but the Holy Ghost teacheth. We call that uh, verbal inspiration. Verbal means that every word was given by God. Not just the thoughts and the, the, the overall uh, intent and the concepts of the Bible. Yeah, they were given by God too, but he gave the very words. Every word of God is pure. Not just every thought of God. You know, some people want to change the Bible. They want to make it more convenient in some way. But uh, we need to be careful about that because God has given us the very words of Scripture. Words are important. And uh, so we have the revealing of truth. We have the recording of truth. And we have the retention of truth. We have the mind of Christ. We call this preservation. Contrary to what some worldly wisdom might say, God's word has never been lost, only to be restored by the cults. God's word is not marred by scribal errors, unless you're talking about the corrupted manuscripts that are out there, which is a, a small percentage of the manuscript evidence. God's word has not been corrupted or marred by scribal error. God's word is not lost in translation, unless you're translating from a corrupt manuscript, of course. You see, God promises and assures us that he has preserved his word. Not man, but he. In Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. This is a wonderful book that we have. God's wisdom. And God's wisdom never changes. So how can we know God's wisdom? This is the last question. Well, first we understand that not everybody can know God's wisdom. We read that in verses 6 through 8. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So not everyone can know the wisdom of God. According to verse number six, it's understood by them that are perfect. Well, count me out. <laughs> I'm not perfect. Well, hang on a moment. This perfection is explained to us. What does it mean to be perfect? Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. So the reason that 
the wisdom of God is hidden is because it is hidden from the natural man. Do you remember the days before you became a Christian, before you got saved? And maybe you were brought up in church, maybe you weren't, but for a lot of people they'd say, you know, I tried reading the Bible. It just didn't make any sense. I couldn't figure it out. I mean, it was just like a a strange book to me. A lot of people have that experience. It's a mystery book. But I'll tell you, when you get born again, when you get saved, it's as if your eyes are opened. And suddenly the Bible becomes relevant. It's real and it's speaking to you. And truly, your eyes have been opened because that's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, that's the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Then Paul says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. And then it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. You see the difference here? When you get saved, when you're born again, you receive the Spirit of God, the indwelling Spirit. He comes and takes up residence. In verse 12, back in chapter 2 here of 1 Corinthians, it says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. And as a Christian with the indwelt Spirit of God, he, he illuminates the Scripture. That's why when you get saved, you can begin to understand the Bible. He he is the one who teaches us. He's the one who confirms truth to us when we need assurance. The Spirit of God bears witness through the Word of God with our spirit that we are the children of God. There's a vast difference between the saved and the lost. If you're saved, this Bible knowledge and spiritual maturity doesn't just come by osmosis. It's something you have to grow in. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But the, the, the difference is that when you get saved, even though you may be a babe in Christ and you've got all of this Bible reading and Bible knowledge and the wisdom of God to to learn, you have a teacher who lives within, the Spirit of God. If you're lost, you're going to struggle. Now, there are parts of the Bible that God gives us, I believe, to help us get saved. He wants us to be saved. He gives us the Gospel of John. He gives us the Book of Romans, and you can find the way of salvation there, but much of the Bible is a closed book until God brings the light into your heart, and the Spirit of God is there. Let me give you some requirements, Christian, for Christian growth. I'm not going to read these scriptures. You might want to jot them down. But there's there's four things I think are very important if you want to grow in the Lord. You can't just sit there with a Bible on the counter and pick it up on Sunday and bring it to church. (laughs) So here here are some things. They all start with the letter S. First of all, search the scriptures. Acts 11, uh, 17, verse 11. Search the scriptures. You've got to open the book. You've got to do some searching. Number two, study the scriptures. 2 Timothy 2.15, study. Oh, that sounds like work, yeah? Study. Dig it out. Uh, then number three, store the scriptures. Store them. I don't mean put the Bible in a, in a cupboard Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. You've got to get it into your heart. So search the scriptures, study the scriptures, store the scriptures, and then lastly, settle the scriptures into your life. James 1, That means don't be a hearer of the word, but be a doer. Don't say, well, that's nice. The Bible teaches that. What are you going to do about it? Now, that's how you grow as a Christian. And it's an exciting life. The Psalm 119 
gives us a, a similar pattern. It says, first of all, mark the scriptures, verse 9. Um, take heed to th- thy word, uh, take heed to the word of God, mark it. Then memorize it, and then meditate on it, verse 15. Uh, the word of God is the wisdom of God. So the more the Bible changes your life and you're transformed by the renewing uh, of your mind when you get that old hard drive going out of your life and you're putting in a new program you become more and more like Christ and you have the knowledge of God but before any of this can really take place you need to be saved salvation is where it begins that's why Paul when he came to Corinth he said some of you you were full of human wisdom you thought you knew everything you were too smart to even listen to what I had to say. You just scoffed at it and you went on your way. He said, that's because God's wisdom is so much higher than anything man can, can come up with. Man could not have written the Bible. He wouldn't put in the, in the Bible all the bad things that men did, for starters. He wouldn't have come up with uh, the plan of salvation that the Bible has that It's not through human merit. It's not through offering sacrifices on idols or uh, all of that sort of thing. That's what man would do. But the Bible has a very unique plan of salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith in Christ. That's all, not of works. Man wouldn't have put it that way. This is a supernatural book. This is the wisdom of God. And you know the wisdom of God makes way makes plain the way of salvation it's simple paul wrote about it here in both chapter one and chapter two it's christ crucified it's jesus who died on the cross paid the penalty for your sins and he paid them in full so that when you put your faith in him the blood of jesus christ is applied to your account so to speak and the sins that you've committed are under the blood they're covered by the blood and you can be forgiven you will be forgiven and you'll be changed and then Jesus comes and changes our life we're made a new creature old things have passed away behold all things have become new that's how we get saved just come as saying well I need to get saved and I want to trust Christ and he'll save you he doesn't hold it out and say try to catch it he says here it is it's a whosoever will invitation and then when we get saved the great blessing one of the great blessings of salvation is that we stand in the wisdom of God again in second first Corinthians chapter 2 verse 5 that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God we sang that song my faith has found a resting place Not in device nor creed, I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me, I plead. That's how we're saved.